This is an exciting evening to be able to talk about a property that uh, we've uh, just acquired. And uh, it's, you think it'd be getting old hat. Um, we, the land trust is now holding about 25 properties or so, but uh, we're figuring it out this evening. We've actually conserved 37 properties over the years, uh, but a bunch of those were uh, added to the uh, national park and to the provincial park. And so, uh, and a couple of others that we worked with, with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So um, in 30 years, over 30 properties and still going strong. There's a lot going on in uh, the Leaders Creek area. And I think uh, we'll find that uh, what Calder and Maggie have to say about Whippoorwill Woods is um, the tip of the iceberg for the whole Leaders Creek complex. So thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Calder, for uh, bringing this to us tonight. Take it away. Hello, my name is Maggie. I'm a biologist with the Thousand Islands Watershed Land Trust. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about the broader area that the Whippoorwill Woods property falls within and the significance of this area, as this contributes directly towards the ecological features of the Whippoorwill Woods property. Um, so then we'll talk more about the Whippoorwill Woods property, um, some more of the on the ground fieldwork finds that make this property really special. So to start off, the, the property is within the Leaders Creek wetland complex. So this has been a focal point for Tualt conservation for a few years now because of its ecological significance within the watershed. The Leaders Creek wetland complex is a large chain of wetlands found along Leaders Creek. And Leaders Creek connects Graham Lake to Charleston Lake. The, this wetland complex has been designated as provincially significant and it's been given this designation for its biological features, the biodiversity, the habitat that it provides for wildlife, as well as the ecosystem services that it provides. So ecosystem services are the direct or indirect benefits provided to humans by nature. So they can be described in four broad categories, which are provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural. So some of the examples that, that fit in these categories are food, freshwater, climate adaptation, flood, drought mitigation, uh, pollination, nutrient cycling, and just the overall recreational value that we, that we feel when we're out in nature. These ecosystem services can be converted to a dollar value. And it's astonishing what this value is that the ecosystem services provide to us. This includes flood mitigation, drought, mitigation, groundwater recharge, climate adaptation, and carbon storage, as well as water filtration, uh, the filtering out toxins from the water and excess nutrients. This is an, a very important component of the Leaders Creek wetland complex. If you remember, the Leaders Creek connects Graham Lake to Charleston Lake. And these two lakes actually have different nutrient levels in them. Graham Lake is a very shallow lake, which has moderate nutrient levels, referred to as mesotrophic. Charleston Lake, in comparison, is a deeper lake, and it has lower nutrient values, referred to as oligotrophic. And this is important because Charleston Lake has been designated as a highly sensitive lake trout lake, because lake trout need those high dissolved oxygen levels that are found within oligotrophic lakes. So the, along Leaders Creek, uh, the wetlands here are filtering out these excess nutrients as the water flows from Graham Lake to Charleston Lake. So now that we've talked about the broader area and the significance, let's talk specifically about the Whippoorwill Woods property. Before we get too far into the features of the property, we should talk about the namesake of the property, the Eastern Whippoorwill. So this is a species at risk bird. It's considered threatened in Ontario and Canada. It's a nocturnal bird that can be easily recognized by its call at nighttime. Uh, it's, it will say its, its name Whippoorwill, Whippoorwill over and over and over again uh, throughout the night. Uh, the habitat requirements that this species needs includes a mix of forested and open areas. It's an insectivore, so they like areas with wetlands that have a lot of insects. 
And one of, the, one of the main reasons why this species is considered threatened is because of habitat loss and fragmentation. Before we found out about the Whippoorwill Woods property, we actually had a monitoring transect set up to monitor the presence of these birds in the area, uh, specifically on one of our nearby properties. This transect runs right along the Whippoorwill Woods property. And during each survey at nighttime, we uh, repeatedly heard calls coming from the area of this property. So before we even knew about the property, we knew that there were whippoorwills on the property, which is very important. Uh, this is a map showing the species occurrences of the eastern whippoorwills. So you can see on the yellow dots there, uh, those are recorded observations. You can see in this map just how fragmented uh, their, their species records are. So this is why it's, it's very important to protect these properties that have these threatened species to uh, continue, so that they can continue to have that habitat there as habitat loss and fragmentation is one of the main threats to the species. We consider the Whippoorwill Woods property a keystone property because it fits in, essentially fits in like a puzzle piece of protected areas. It connects to Charleston Lake Provincial Park uh, a large block of crown land, approximately 3,000 acres, as well as a uh, twilt protected property under a conservation easement agreement. Some important designations on the property are the provincially significant wetlands found along Leaders Creek. As well, there is an area of natural and scientific interest referred to as an ANSI. This is an area that's been identified for its unique biology and biodiversity features. It's a life science ANSI, which has also been given the designation as being provincially significant. The property has topography and geology that are, that's characteristic for the Frontenac Arch re region that we know. It has shallow soils, rocky ridges, and exposed granite bedrock throughout the property. There are three main habitat types of the Whippoorwill Woods property. This includes wetlands, forest, and fields. The wetlands and forests are the largest uh, habitat features on the property, where the field represents only about one hectare or two and a half acres of the property. The wetlands are a combination of marsh and swamp ecosystems. We typically classify wetlands based on their vegetation characteristics. Marshes have emergent vegetation like grasses and cattails, and they often have larger pools of open water with floating leaf plants and submerged aquatic plants as well. Whereas swamps are uh, woody, they're, they're dominated by wo woody species of shrubs like dogwoods or trees, lowland trees like black ash, red maple, silver maple. So having this combination of marsh and swamp ecosystems contributes to the, the biodiversity of the property. For an example, uh, we typically see a lot more turtles found within marshes, whereas swamps are very important for other species like amphibians. Salamanders like the moist soils of the swamp forest transition zones and they also breed in vernal pools found within swamps that dry up later on in the summertime. The forests on the property are largely composed of a mix of sugar maple and white pine. That's the most dominant forest cover type on the property. There are smaller pockets of deciduous dominated habitats, uh, including sugar maples and oaks, etc. There's a combination of interior and edge habitat found on the property, which supports a variety of different species. Interior habitat is usually found uh, greater than 100 meters from the edge of the forest, and it's a very unique habitat type, considering all the fragmentation on our landscape now. This habitat supports species like owls, warblers, woodpeckers, etc. And edge habitat is also important for other species. So species like uh, chickadees, 
wood thrushes, eastern wood peewee. Having this combination of interior and edge habitat further supports the wildlife on the property and contributes to a greater diversity of species present. The field section of the property is a small area. It's dominated by species of grasses, goldenrods, milkweeds, etc. These are representative photos of these habitat types. In the top left corner, we see the forest area. You can see there are some older uh, sugar maples within the stand, as well as some younger and mid-age uh, trees. And there's a diversity of understory ground cover layer as well. In the middle, at the bottom, this is the field section. It's uh, a, a pretty narrow open area with lots of grasses and other flowering plants. In the top right corner, we see the wetland on the property. This is one angle of the wetland that is located along Leaders Creek. You can see that it's mainly dominated by species like grasses. We've collected a diverse species list of reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, insects, trees and shrubs, and herbaceous plants. We'll be continuing to increase this species list as we go on into the 2024 field season. This species list includes a variety of flora and fauna that are characteristic to the Frontenac Arch region. In this area, we know that the five forest regions meet here, and this we see, we see species here that are not found anywhere else in the country. On this property, we see species that coexist together where they would not uh, coexist anywhere else. These photos here are just a few of the really interesting wildlife observations we've found so far. On the left-hand side, there's a photo of an otter slide that we saw this winter. In the middle is a beaver lodge, and the right-hand photo is uh, one of my favorites. We found a uh, collection of snake skin sheds that are gray rat snake skins. So far, we have found four species at risk on the property. This includes the eastern whippoorwill, the eastern wood peewee, the wood thrush, and gray rat snake. There are also an additional nine species at risk records that are found within one kilometer of the property, according to the Natural Heritage Information Center. We expect that there are actually many more species at risk found on or near the property as well. Uh, and we'll be continuing to work on uh, determining which species are found here throughout the field season. So we've officially purchased the property and the work doesn't stop here. Similar to all of our other properties, we'll be out on the properties during the field season, monitoring at least once a year. We're going to be performing further studies on the property to learn more about the species found here and the species at risk as well. We'll be installing a bat monitor to record audio recordings and identify which bat species are found near the property. And we're also going to be continuing the Whippoorwill survey transect as we have in the past. Thank you for taking the time to learn about the Whippoorwill Woods property. Now I pass it over to Calder. All right, thank you uh, very much, Maggie. I think everyone can agree that that property is, is amazing when it comes to the, the ecological value that is on it. You know, you've got special habitat features, you've got species at risk, there's even the the mitigation of threats in the relatively low uh, number of invasive species that we're seeing out there. So it really is something exceptional. And the fact that it's exceptional is actually something that I wanted to talk about uh, here in my kind of half of this presentation. Um, sorry, one moment there. There we go. Um, the, the reason it's spectacular is, is uh, actually a big part of the reason that we were able to acquire this property. You see, Whippoorwill Woods... Uh, is unlike most properties that we do, because it's actually one that we purchased. Now, if you were at last month's Conservation Cafe, you will have learned quite a bit about the donation processes that we have, conservation easement agreements and um, fee simple donations, split receding, all those really, really good tools. Uh, and if, if that sounds interesting to you and you'd like to learn uh, more and you haven't, uh, you haven't watched it or you weren't able to join us last month, 
you can catch the VOD on our YouTube and on our uh, website if you want to you learn about those sorts of things. But one of the things that we talked about with, uh, you know, in that conversation was property purchase. But we didn't talk very much about it because it's something that honestly, the land trust is relatively new to. Uh, in our 30 year history, um, we have only purchased and then subsequently kept to, to conserve three properties. Uh, and all of them have been within the past five years, uh, starting with the leader property in uh, in 2019. So this is kind of a new realm for us. And we've we've been finding a lot of success. We've been blown away by the support that we've gotten when we when we've been going after these uh, sorts of purchases. Um, but we're also learning a lot with every purchase project that we do. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, I, I wouldn't even I wouldn't call it the good, the bad, the ugly, but some of the big wins that we had in doing this and some of the some of the lessons that we learned while we were going through, because it wasn't a smooth process. Uh, we brought it across the finish line in the end, as, as Maggie was saying, but uh, but there there were certainly some lessons to be learned. So we're going to talk about that. The great thing is that this whole thing kicked off in a really, really good way. Because this was a property that didn't, uh, it didn't come to us by a landowner seeking us out. It didn't come to us by, um, you know, us actually going out and seeking out this property. This was a property that was recommended to us by one of our partner organizations, the Nature Conservancy Canada. And how that happened was the property was actually on the market. It was to be sold. And the realtor who was working to sell that property had seen na the Nature Conservancy of Canada, uh, often called NCC, had se he had seen them purchase a property nearby his own house for very similar reasons uh, that that we're looking at the, the Whipperwill Woods property. It was a big piece of rural property. There were a lot of ecosystem services, species at risk, the whole nine. And so when this came across his desk, he thought, well, why not talk to the Nature Conservancy and see if they're interested in this one too? Well, when he got in touch, the Nature Conservancy told him that they weren't actually taking on new projects in the area. They had some other big irons in the fire in other parts of the country. And the Nature Conservancy told him they're not at this point interested in the property, um, but you should talk to the land trust. You should talk to the Thousand Island Watershed Land Trust about this. And this is one of the biggest, uh, biggest things that we love about working, not just in our area, but in the land trust world in general, where there are so many organizations that are all kind of accomplishing similar things working together you know we are not precious about the projects that we do uh, and a lot of organizations feel the same that it, it matters less who ends up holding a property uh, as uh, as long as they are you know the right people to do it it matters less who actually ends up holding it than it does that the property gets conserved in the first place and a lot of the time, what that means is that we're able to conserve a property or receive a property recommendation or, or receive a property uh, idea like this one. And if we don't feel perfectly comfortable or we don't think we're quite the right people to be doing this project, we can pass it along and say, actually, I think you should talk to these folks or you should talk to these folks. And this is exactly what NCC did here. And we're really, really glad they did. You know, the land trust is uh, very specialized in the region that we work in. You know, we have our uh, little working area. And even within our working area, we have a major area of focus in the Leaders Creek wetland complex right now. I know Maggie said there, this is the the fourth uh, property that we're protecting in that area. And and there's kind of a push happening. And so the Nature Conservancy recognized all this and and recommended us to the realtor as the as probably the best people to take care of that property. And and we're really thankful that they did. And uh, as of the end of last month, it all worked out very well. Um, so that was a really, really great start to the project. It came out really, really well. One of the first things that we did uh, was arrange a visit to the property to verify its condition. When we first got the email, we first got connected with the realtor. We did all of the, the you know, quote, boring stuff. Um, we did all of the, the maps and we looked at the zoning and the official plan and all of that kind of desktop analysis type work to see what the property was offering as far as ecological value goes. But as many of you know, you really can't know a property until you have gone and visited it yourself. And so one of the early things that we did was actually arrange this field day to go and walk the property. We took some interested parties. 
um, had some really good conversations on, you know, sitting back in the woods, uh, having lunch and, and just walked the property, had a look at it and really got to, got to know it, or at least the parts that we were able, uh, to visit. And I was very pleased to say that it, uh, it, it absolutely lived up to expectation. It was a gorgeous piece of property. The woods were, were very, very nice. There were some great old trees in there. Maggie had a picture of one in the last, uh, in the, the front half of the presentation, um, and, you know, it's smattered with these great, great wetlands. So it was just a, an amazing day. Um, these are two pictures that we took from that day. And they're gorgeous pictures. But I want to know if you think that there's anything strange about them. I'll give you a second to to look at them and think about it. If there's, if there's anything that strikes you as strange about these pictures. So <laughs> they are amazing pictures, uh, amazing uh, pieces of property. Um, but as you'll notice, these pictures were very obviously taken in the summertime, um, which means that the time that we did this walk and the time that we got notification of the property was five, six months ago. We got that first email in July, started working. These uh, pictures came around, I think, about the end of August or early September. Um, and so you have to think, why was there such a delay between July hearing about the property and the end of January actually closing on the purchase? I know, I mean, not, not every purchase goes smoothly, but that is a, still a fairly long timeline for buying a piece of property. And the reason that we had this big delay, the reason that it took so long for us to bring this one over the finish line, goes to the backbone of all of the problems we've had on this property, it's title. And this is kind of an understandable, kind of a forgivable issue, and one that we've noticed uh, with a bunch of the purchase projects that we've done. In fact, this is one of the big lessons that we've learned, is that you always have to check the title early in the process. This is a symptom of how old the system is. You know, these are documents that in some cases go back uh, as far as two centuries. You know, these are, these are documents that are uh, representations of, like, the point where land ownership became a concept in Canada, right? So you think about how long ago that was, the time that has passed between now and then, and all of the process updates, all of the, the changes in government, all of the digitization of these records that would have happened throughout the past, you know, 20 years or so. Um, there's a lot of room for errors to be made. There's a lot of room for problems. And so we have run up uh, in the course of of doing this project, we ran up on a few of those problem problems, and that was where a lot of the the delay came from. Um, so we looked at the records all the way back to 1857 when the crown sold the property to its original um, colonial owner. And between 1857 and today, there is quite a storied history on Whipperwill Woods. Uh, we found boundary changes, we found severances, and and kind of most interestingly, we found a lawsuit from 1886 uh, in the amount of $193, which is about $5,000 in today's money. And this was levied against the Gananoque Power Company by the owners of the of what is now the Whipperwill Woods property. And this lawsuit was brought in because of high water levels in Charleston Lake. You see, at this point in history, uh, and actually, as I'm led to believe, as they still are, the Gananoque Power Company was responsible for the water level in Charleston Lake and a bunch of the lakes surrounding. And so in 1886, something happened. Uh, somebody somebody fell asleep at the wheel or, or, or made a bad decision and, and the, the level of Charleston Lake went way up. And the reason I'm including this is, is to, to add the historical element, but also to demonstrate something that I think is really, really interesting. And that is that the Whipperwill Woods property is not on Charleston Lake. It is near Charleston Lake. It, it's it's upstream of Charleston Lake. It's in the headwaters, but it is not on Charleston Lake. And the fact that the water level rising in Charleston Lake was severe enough to move upstream to the point that it damaged this property. It cost five thousand dollars worth of damage to this property upstream kilometers from the lake itself. It is uh, it is incredibly um, adept at painting the connectivity of the watershed shows you that everything is connected we always think of every, you know everything flows downstream well apparently some things flow upstream um when you're when you're uh changing water levels like that 
Now, to be honest, I thought that was a really cool um, demonstration, a really cool little anecdote, but that didn't have much of a bearing on the length of the process of acquiring it. Um, where we found the most uh, roadblocks, I would say, um, is on the uh, property's title, specifically in pertaining to the boundaries. Um, the boundaries of the property had quite a few questions on them. It has a very irregular boundary. Uh, and there were a number of things that we found ourselves having to work through and figure out in order to actually get things in a state where we we knew what was going on on the property and we knew that uh, it was all going to be okay, essentially. Um, and I'm not going to share all of them uh, because if I did that, we would be here forever. But I will share two of the of the more serious ones so that you can see what we were looking at, maybe why this took so long. Um, and keep in mind, we're going back and forth between title searchers the buyer, the realtor, and the lawyers. Um, so it is it is quite a, a, a large beast that we're trying to wrangle as we're working through these, uh, these questions. Um, one of the things that we found was that early in this property's life, there were severances made to it, um, specifically to take out sort of the northeastern corner and grant it to a different person. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and grant it to a different person. There were some places on title where that section was described as the east half of the north half of the lot, or put more simply, the northeastern corner of the lot. And there were other sections that described that area as the northeastern 100 acres of the lot. And those two are not equivalent to each other. When you measure those out on a map, they're actually different sizes. And so we weren't sure which of those measurements was actually correct, which was to be followed. And if our mapping was showing the wrong one, we weren't sure how much land we were going to quote unquote lose. Or more appropriately, we weren't sure how much smaller the property would be <laughs> if, if the way that we were mapping it was incorrect. And the way we solved this was actually with a lot of help from the title search, who kind of did know where, like, if, if you were to draw those over the, the lot of the property, that the title searcher did know where they would have fallen and was able to mark it on a paper map with some X's of like, okay, this is where, you know, the property line would be if it's this, and, and the one that we have is where it would be if it's the other. Um, so what I did is I, I took that, and using the line that, that uh, she drew, I mapped that onto a, uh, like, I used, I used one of the lakes on the property as a reference point. And I basically drew the property line as if the boundary were in that second place that she had identified. And from there, I was able to measure the difference in the size of the property if, uh, you know, if one measurement was bigger than the other. And what we found was that no matter how this would shake out, the property would only fluctuate in size by a factor of about five years. Um, on a large property like this, um, you know, hundred, uh, you know, nearly 150 acre property, Give or take five acres isn't that big of a problem. It's not a deal breaker. Um, and so we thought, you know, that's that's an acceptable risk. You know, best case scenario, we don't, you know, it, the property is as we understand it. Worst case scenario, it's five acres smaller than we understand it. I think it's still a very worthy project, even if it is five acres smaller. Uh, so that was the first one that we went through. The second one uh, pertains to this really, really weird lot that is, uh, looks like it has been like carved out, like a chunk has been taken out of our property, of Whipper Will Woods, and turned into this other lot. And for a lot of the process, we were looking at that as if it was a, its own property, because it is. It has its own uh, PIN number, it, it pays its own taxes. It was actually sold uh, relatively recently, um, independently of this property that we just purchased. But when we got the report back from the title searcher, the title searcher said, yeah, that property, that little piece, that little chunk sold for back taxes. And I have no idea how they did that because there is no record of that piece ever being severed off of this main property. Legally, there's a case to be made that that little part, that little chunk is still on Whipperwill Woods. Now, we thought of the ways that we could approach this. And by the time we got this news, we were, I would say, three, four months, maybe five months into all of the work here we've been doing with the title. And we thought, well, this little chunk is really, you know, a nice a nice addition to the property. It's great for conservation land. You know, there's there's no road frontage to it. 
it's almost entirely wetland uh, and it, it, it fits really well into Whippoorwill Woods. Um, but we thought if we try and pursue this now without closing the deal, we're going to overrun, you know, our time on this. And, and, and it's, it's more important for us to finish this and then pursue that smaller chunk than to try and do it all at once and drag this thing out for even longer. Um, so what we did was we resolved to investigate that further once the main property was uh, acquired. And we were kind of lucky that we were able to do that because when we were first pitched the property by the uh, realtor, when we were uh, talking about the property to people, um, that little chunk was never assumed to, to be part of it. So really, um, what we stand to do is if we're if we're successful in acquiring this little piece, as as we have started the investigation now that um, Whippoorwill Woods has been conserved, if we're successful in 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 unraveling that mystery and acquiring that piece of property, we stand to to add twenty five to thirty acres to the size of Whippoorwill Woods. Again, if we aren't able to, then the property is as we understood it. We haven't you know functionally lost. It. So we thought that was a reasonable uh, way to go. We wanted to get this one across the finish line. And we have started looking at that smaller property now to see if there's something to be done for it. Um, so those are two those are two examples of, of the myriad things that we had to work through. And many of them were like that. And in the middle of this, you know, things were really piling up. Uh, I had, you know, e emails, emails all day. I was on the phone all the time trying to get this thing sorted out. Um, and there was there was one point where I started to lose hope a little bit. I'll admit, I'll admit I started to lose hope because I, I called the lawyer's office. And this was at a point when the title searcher had completed their search, put everything together and sent it to the lawyer, but we had not yet seen that document. So the lawyer had a little bit of information that we didn't at this point. And I called up the lawyer to ask a completely unrelated question about the, about the process of the property. And the person who picked up the other phone was someone I, I hadn't spoken to before. Uh, and so I introduced myself to her. I said, hi, my name is Paul Schweitzer. I'm the executive director of the Thousand Islands Watershed Land Trust. I'd like to talk uh, uh, to somebody about this property that we're buying and see if there's an update. And I heard her on the other line go, okay, Paul Schweitzer, the Thousand Islands Watch. Oh, yeah, you're the folks that are buying that nightmare property, um, which was a bit of a wake up call for me, a, a little bit of a, uh, you know, I couldn't help but laugh, but uh, I was certainly feeling feeling that way at the time, uh, as were they, clearly. Um, thankfully, we had some very uh, resilient people working on it and, and some folks who were, were able to get pretty creative. Uh, and we were, as you know, able to bring it across the finish line. But it was wavery for a second there. But, you know, we persevered. Um, once we got that document outlining all of the issues that went through, um, the land trust's lawyer essentially said, look, we have all of these problems. They're not things that are devastating, but they're not things that necessarily should be ignored entirely so here's what you can do if you get a plan of reference which uh is colloquially called a property survey um literally all of these problems will go away the problems will all be solved if you get a property survey. that's the good news the bad news is we gathered some quotes for you and the quote is thirty five thousand dollars to survey the property. and that was because of the property's very remote nature as well as the complexity of the boundary line and the fact that parts of the boundary line are underwater, um, it made it kind of difficult <laughs> for the surveyors. And so we were at a bit of an impasse here. We thought, well, we have this massive, you know, this massive property, this really, really great piece that we're looking to buy. Thirty-five thousand dollars for for uh, a survey is a lot of money, but it would solve the problems that we're having. So. At this point, I figured, okay, I've done, I've done what I can. Uh, I can make a recommendation, but this is a board decision. So I put all this together uh, into a presentation, and I presented it to the board, uh, who had a, a very great discussion about it. If I'm being honest, we actually talked about it for over the course of two meetings. Um, we we talked about it for about four hours total, um, trying to figure out what the best plan of action is. And ultimately, we decided that. It was important to us to conserve this property because through all of this, the property is still on the market. It could theoretically be sold out from under us during this entire process uh, to somebody who doesn't, you know, a, a, an individual who doesn't necessarily have the same due diligence requirements or, or an individual who is OK, willing to just hand wave those those title issues in a way that we're not able to. Um, so we thought it's, it's most important to get this conserved. 
Um, we're willing to put up the money to do that. You know, it's a property purchase. We've had an incredible outpouring of support from our uh, from our supporter base. Um, and, and so we have some funds that would be able to go to something like this. And on top of it, we have grant money that is, uh, you know, going to be helping out as well. So we thought, let's go. For it. And the one thing that we were able to do was uh, have the seller as, as a recognition of the the issues and a recognition of the uh, very high cost of solving those issues, we were able to get the seller to reduce the purchase price by uh, an amount equal to half of what the survey would cost. So $17,500. Uh, and so they paid half and we pay half and we now have that, uh, we have that surveyor on retainer waiting for the green light uh, as we investigate this other smaller piece. And then once we Put that to bed or decide we're going to to um acquire it then we'll we'll order that survey um so that's how it all came across the finish line there were quite a quite a few questions quite a lot of back and forth um and, and quite a lot of legalese i learned like 30 new words over the course of this thing uh talking about you know pertaining to title searches and property boundaries and all that kind of a thing so it wasn't just a learning opportunity for the land trust it was a learning opportunity for me personally as well. Um, ultimately, I think we made the right decision. I am thrilled that this property was uh, was conserved. But the question always remains, when you're doing something new, you're doing something with these, these big dollar uh, values attached to it, you know, you always are asking yourself, is it worth the trouble? Was it worth the trouble to conserve this property, to go through five, six months of work back and forth with the lawyers, looking at 200 year old documents, trying to figure out what, they, what they're telling me, is it worth the trouble? And when I think back to that first visit that we did, when we saw the amazing Frontenac Arch style forest with the ridges and those big old trees that Maggie had in her pictures earlier. When I think about the wetlands, 60% of them, provincially significant, the ecosystem services they provide, the, the habitat they provide for species at risk. When I think about the, the moving waterways and uh, and the wetlands on the property, the fields and everything that is, is, is contributing to this beautiful property, the answer to my question, is it worth the trouble, was a firm and resounding yes. Absolutely it was. I couldn't be happier that this property is now conserved. It's, it's uh, ecological value. I think cannot be overstated, and I'm I'm just really proud of everybody at Twilt uh, for for bringing this one across the finish line. So that's the story. Those were our trials and tribulations of uh, of conserving Whipperwill Woods. It started on a really high note. We had a little bit of a slog to get through, but it came across the finish line at the end, thanks to so much help from you know the professionals that we had uh, working with us, the lawyers, the realtor, uh, the sellers, even and and the Twilt, you know, board volunteers, and most of all, the donors uh, and the supporters of the land trust. You know, it's you guys that made this happen um, with with your support. And and this is a, a, a beautiful piece of property that is conserved forever. And it just makes my heart sing to think about that. So thank you, all of you, for your support of the land trust and allowing to do projects like this. And thank you all so much for joining us here tonight to hear the story. Now, I'm certain that Maggie is uh, going to stick around and, and answer any questions you might have about the ecology of the property. I'll be here happy to answer any questions you might have about the, the process of acquiring it. But uh, if you don't have any questions or if you're not uh, able to stick around, then I just want to say one more time, thank you so much for joining us. This has been our second Conservation Cafe back since we uh, stopped calling them Science Cafes. And uh, I want to thank you all for being a part of it.